quick introductions of this uh, panel. First of all, we'll be hearing from Dina Titus, and um, Senator Titus has been in the state senate since 1989. She's currently serving as the Senate Minority Leader. She is uh, a professor, a teacher, and a scholar here, and a distinguished member of our faculty here at UNLV. We'll also be hearing from Jane Ann Morrison, who many of you know, she's been working for the last 15 years about with the uh, Review Journal here in Las Vegas the last couple of years as the general interest columnist and as a um, reporter covering politics for about 13 years before that. And uh, the work with the RJ is the latest in a distinguished career in journalism for Jane Ann Morrison that started with the Christian Science Monitor in 1971. And then finally, we'll welcome and hear from Professor Artis Broderick Sohn. Professor Sohn is, has joined UNLV in, in, as the director of the Greenspun School of Journalism and Media Studies. She's been here in that position and as a professor since July of this year. And she's an expert in media management and in the ethics of media. And uh, because of uh, Dina Titus' scheduling issues, we're going to start with Dina Titus. Well, thank you very much for doing that. I'd like to start by saying I was opposed to that law that the legislature passed that was found unconstitutional, but the legislature never seems to let a little problem like the Constitution stand in its way when it's determined to do something. Uh, you know, when I think about civility, I think about the things you learned in kindergarten. It's uh, playing nice, it's saying please and thank you. Uh, it's just having good manners. And certainly, if you look at politics today, you see we've come a long way from the notion of being polite and having good manners. In the legislature itself, there are certain traditions about civility, more so in the Senate than in the Assembly. The Senate sees itself as more of an upper house, more formal, more proper, and we have these traditions. Now, they are only traditions. They're not rules, so they just exist by virtue of the fact that people see some value in continuing to follow them. But let me give you an example. If you never call somebody by their name on the floor of the Senate, you never say, well, Dina, wants to do so and so. You always say, my colleague from District 7. Now, if you disagree with them, you may say something about the issue of my esteemed colleague from District 7. And if you think they are a real idiot, you say my most esteemed colleague from District 7. Everybody knows exactly the point you're trying to make, but you do it in kind of a nice way. Uh, when you compare the Senate to the Assembly and some of those formalities, some of the examples are that it's only been in recent years that women wore trousers on the floor of the Senate. They always wore dresses. They, were, they thought that this was a more formal way to go. No eating in the, on the floor of the assem, uh, Senate and no smoking. Now on the assembly side, they used to just have picnics all the time and they smoked right on the floor. You may recall hearing about the time Marvin Sedway caught his beard on fire. This was quite, a, quite an event in the assembly, but you don't have that on the Senate side. There's also no singing in the Senate while they like to sing and play the guitar in the assembly and certainly no swearing, no, no use of four letter words. There are no personal insults either. If somebody insults you or impugns your integrity or calls you an idiot, then you call a point of personal order. Call a point of order so that you can say, you know, that's an inappropriate uh, language or behavior. The problem is what is determined to be inappropriate or impugning your character is a determination that's made by the person who holds the gavel. So needless to say, that determination is often a political one and may have little to do with actual civility or not. Uh, in the committees, there's also a certain amount of civility. You always address the chair first. You don't interrupt the person who's answering the question. And if you are answering a question, you go to the chair, to you, and through you to somebody else. Well, by the time the hearing is over, people get exhausted going to you and through you. They're going through you and to you, and you don't know who they're going to, so it doesn't really matter. And they start out with that kind of formality all in the beginning of the hearing. Now what's happening though over the years is those formalities are breaking down and we're not as civil as we used to be, we're not as polite as we used to be and some of the reasons for that I think are that there's lots of turnover, new people are coming in, they don't know the traditions, they don't have patience with those kind of old timey ways of doing things. 
Also, people who are elected today often got there on their own. They didn't come up through the ranks, so there's no sense of loyalty to the old guard. There's also a lot of turnover in the sense that you haven't got much time to do things, so you got to get busy while you're there, so you can't be bothered with going through channels. you got to make it happen, and sometimes saying something provocative or uncivil will get you media attention, and that may propel your career ahead. Also, the lobbyist rules that have gone and get, have made just do reporting for expenditures for things that lobbyists spend on uh, legislators means that there's less socializing. So people who are opponents on the floor used to get together for dinner or drink or something in the evening. They don't do that anymore so they can be more vicious on the floor because they aren't more friendly in the informal setting. Um, also, and this is kind of the segue to the topic here, is that campaigns have become so vicious that you don't leave them behind when you go to the legislature. They carry over with you. You remember how brutal your, uh, the other side was, and so you don't forget that once the, session is, once the campaign is over and the session begins. As you heard uh, from the scholars already today, a negative campaigning is not anything new. It goes back throughout American history. In fact, in the early days, some of the candidates were even known for throwing animal excrement at each other. So that was, those campaigns got really dirty. But now there's more to know. We know more about this negative campaigning for a number of reasons. There's a lot of scholarship on it. Political science has turned it all into kind of a subfield. It's almost an industry to study campaigning and negative campaigning. Because it's on television, now more people see it, so there's greater exposure to it. The polling shows that it's worked. Uh, you heard Professor Walton talk about it's the negative campaign and the negative ad that everybody remembers, despite the fact that they all say they hate it. That's the ad that they remember. Also, because of the nature of campaign finance laws, you may not be able to spend but so much, or a person may not be able to contribute but so much, but independent expenditures can operate very differently, so you may run a lot of independent expenditures on a candidate that may be negative. Um, also, if candidates say they won't go negative themselves, don't believe it for a minute. They will. They may not say it themselves, but there will be a third party that will say it for them. That's the, all these third party independent committees that have sprung up. You see them throughout campaigning. Also, they think about the language of politics just reflects this. Um, smash mouth politics. You heard that reference where you just go for the juggler, you say anything, you'll do anything. Uh, and unfortunately, the public likes this because they're so hungry to hear something because politicians uh, don't give good answers, they kind of waver or talk around things, that they mistake some crassness sometimes for straight talk, and so it appeals to the public. How about gotcha politics? You've heard of that. Just try to set somebody up and catch them at doing something negative. Gotcha. Push polls. Just think of the terminology, push polls. This is you call somebody up and ask them, were you going to vote for um, Joe Smith? Well, yeah, I thought I would. Would you still vote for him if you knew he was a child molester? Oh, my gosh, maybe not. Well, <laughs> Joe Smith is probably not a child molester, but you have pushed that person's opinion in a certain direction. Damage control. This is a big part of campaign damage control. That has a negative connotation. And we have politicians playing to this. Think of the politician who says it's a cute idea to off with their thumbs. Or you have, y'all, that may sound familiar. Or you have somebody who is known as Jesse the Bod, as one of my students likes to call him, Ventura, who is the governor of a state. All of this playing into these kinds of negative, uncivil images. Politicians, including the vice president, using four letter words seems to be okay. And the press reporting of the sex scandals and the little blue dress, after that was in the news, there was nothing that you couldn't tell your children about sex education because it had all been out there, top of the fold. Um, you've got a president whose entire foreign policy is based on the notion of let's kick butt. That doesn't sound very civil, but nonetheless, that's the kind of commentary that we, uh, we now see in politics. But I don't think you can just blame politics for being uncivil. I think politics is a reflection of all society. I'd like to agree with you, Craig, that we could do something to make democracy better. But I just think about it. When's the last time somebody said thank you to you? 
or you responded, you're welcome. Nobody says you're welcome anymore, now it's just no problem. And when's the last time you let somebody out in traffic, you missed the light, they went on through, and they didn't even give you a thanks like that. Doesn't that just make you mad? Uh, and then we wear on t-shirts language that's things that your parents wouldn't even do in the privacy of their own bedroom, but we wear them to class. So until you can kind of address that whole civility issue across the board, I don't think you can expect politics to be any different. It just plays into that whole cultural change. Hi. I actually brought some very rude things with me. This um, is a flyer that went out in the campaign against uh, David Parks, who's a very respected assemblyman, Democrat. Um, you might remember this, Tina. It's got Mr. Leather Las Vegas on it, and basically, uh, when you open it up, you first you see Mr. Leather uh, in his apparel, and when you open it up, there's a picture of David Parks plus Mr. Leather teaching homosexuality 101, and then it says it's a bad education for your children. This was dropped, uh, David Parks is gay, and every year he gets uh, dreadful mailers dropped in his, in his race. This one, he didn't even bother to mention it to me because it was so terrible and it was kind of like, well, what's the point? Um, so that's one of the ones I brought. I wanted to show you the uh, county, this was a, a flyer that uh, um, Sheldon Adelson's political team did, and it says County Commissioner Aaron Kenny loves to spend money. It's very slick, it's very nice. Um, you know, why? So she can have more money to spend. This, of course, is funnier now that she's convicted, uh, not convicted, but has pleaded guilty to um, uh, bribery charges. Um, but anyway, this, this one, uh, a lot of money went into it didn't work. The one against David didn't work. This didn't work. You just can't trust Lance Malone is a classic. Um, it's got Lance with his hands in his pockets with lots of money coming out of him and it says uh, County Commissioner Lance Malone said no to putting more casinos in your neighborhood that he took over a hundred thousand dollars from companies that supported more neighborhood casinos. The only problem with this one, A, it worked, but it was anonymous. This, the other two had, had uh, one was a phony group that, that uh, you know, usually there's some, some group that you don't know who they are. This one was anonymous, and this one created the brouhaha because it was anonymous. Um, and maybe because there was an element of truth to it, since he's recently been convicted also. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm the only one up here, maybe Gary Peck, uh, who is paid to be uncivil. I am paid to ask rude questions. And I was thinking about some of the rude questions I ask my coworker Erin Neff up there, the political reporter, the rude questions that she asks as well. These are questions that, that I have had to ask and that she's had to ask. I had to ask a Republican Assembly candidate, did you molest your daughter? It, by the way, it was a Republican who was endorsed by the Review Journal. Um, and it was true, he did molest his daughter. I mean, we have to go to people who have criminal records and who are running for office and ask them very tough and what they believe are uncivil questions. Uh, I had to ask a candidate for U.S. Attorney, did you use cocaine? I had to ask Assemblyman Wendell Williams, why haven't you paid your child support? And of course, there were lots of other questions about Wendell Williams after that. Um, no, a number of us asked question, Clark County Commissioner Mary Kincaid Chauncey, did you really solicit a lap dance for your grandson? Um, I had to ask Jan Jones, why were you crying on stage when Tipper DeGore was, was uh, speaking? All of these became stories. People thought that some of these were incredibly rude, rude questions, and I know I was uh, criticized a lot for writing a story on the fact that Jan Jones was crying on stage with the uh, Tipper Gore. Um, I thought it was a legitimate question. Aaron Neff, uh, my friend, recently asked uh, Jim Gibbons, why should any woman vote for you? I'm pretty sure he, oh, did I miss, oh, that's awful, Jim Gibson, sorry. Um, I'm sure he thought that was a rude question. Um, 
And then on any given day, reporters ask Oscar Goodman, did you really say that? And did you really mean it? Erin <laughs> asked one of the toughest questions, uh, and she asked it at a uh, televised news conference, and then she asked it seriously. And she said, do you have a drinking problem? These are questions that are considered uncivil, certainly by the people uh, that are receiving the questions, and sometimes by the public. That's what we do. We ask those questions, we do stories on them. Um, that's what we're paid to do. And then a lot of times the politicians sort of get the uncivil, you know, the uncivil actions going. And I was looking for some stuff that would be examples. And I looked uh, and I found in 1998, Harry Reid and John Ensign were uh, debating each other. And Ensign was talking about the preventive care he gave to dogs and how preventive maintenance for humans is important. And Harry Reid said to him, we're not worming dogs, we're talking about taking care of people. A few minutes later, Ensign was explaining why he voted against a campaign finance reform bill, saying he believed it was unconstitutional. Reid called Ensign, quote, a vet who also worked in casinos, he shouldn't be interpreting the Constitution. <laughs> he got booed for that. Uh, he got booed royally because people thought that this was rude. Uh, the next week, he, the two of them had another uh, debate, and we had no more of those. And I guess my point is that it sort of depends on the public, uh, how the public responds. The Republic can dismiss these these uh, flyers, or the Republic, uh, the, or the public can accept them. Um, Sylvia was talking about racial uh, flyers. The uh, Supreme Court Justice Mike Douglas is an African American married to a white woman. At the last uh, few days of his campaign, uh, someone dropped a flyer that was subtly racist, you know, pointing out the differences and pointing out that this was an interracial marriage. It uh, went more in rural Nevada than it went in southern Nevada, uh, but rural and northern Nevada got flooded with that. Um, and it didn't work. And that was, that. you're always thrilled when something nasty doesn't work. Uh, but sometimes they do work. Uh, Kathy Augustine uh, dropped uh, racist, uh, anti-Semitic flyers uh, against uh, her opponents, and they worked. She became an assemblyman, she became, uh, became a, a sen state senator based on racist, anti-Semitic flyers. So the public has to take a certain <coughs> responsibility to the, the press, we have to point it out, and then you guys have to uh, think about whether it's relevant or not. Is it time for me to shut up? Oh, okay, then I'll think of more. Um, and, and I think that, uh, and I, I do trust the public. Um, I do agree with uh, Jim Mahan. You just throw it all out there and let it come down. Um, and I've seen a lot of misleading ads, and the press probably could do a better job at pointing out when ads are misleading and when ads are uh, terrible. Uh, the TV ads work on many, many levels, uh, probably more than the flyers do. Um, and the public has a responsibility to sort some of that stuff out. Um, the worst ad, the, one of the things that the RJ does is we don't usually uh, run stories on last minute ads, but the one